Years ago, I heard a sermon that changed my life. In it, the pastor said Genesis 3, 15, and 16 can be viewed as the thesis statement of the whole Bible. That made me think. What, if a thesis, that means one narrative from beginning to end, a whole story, not hundreds of little broken up ones. With that idea, I went to work reading it as one. Here's what we get. In the beginning, God created and said, it is good, it is good, it is good. Interestingly, the words of the four rivers that surround the garden, when translated, are like rapid, increase, abundance. We're also told about all the precious metals and gold that existed, and it was called good. So then God made mankind and a special man, Adam. It was good. But for the first time, when Adam proved to be lonely, God said, it is not good, and made a woman by putting Adam under a deep sleep, performing advanced genetic surgery, taking out a rib, and making a woman, Eve. In various myths, legends, and narratives, God gave them one command about a certain tree that they would somehow alter their consciousness and connection to him in a way that God deemed destructive if they ate from it. They were tempted by a third party who was either given access or snuck in called a Nakash, serpent or deceiver, who twisted words deceitfully. The observation is that this Nakash took advantage. Has God indeed said that you should not eat of any tree in the garden? No, no, Eve said, just this one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If we eat that one, we will die. You won't die. God just doesn't want your eyes open. In other words, he just wants to control you in his closed system. But really, your eyes will be open to the knowledge of good and evil. You'll have the full picture. You'll see what mankind can really do. Seems childish, but think about it. Has mankind demonstrated mastery over knowing good and evil? Hmm, interesting. Here, says the Nakash, eat the fruit. Deceived. Problem. Adam and Eve realized they were naked before God. Innocence gone. No covering. Shame, guilt, in need of a remedy, of covering. God says in Genesis 3, 15 and 16, Wait, Satan has seed? Yes. So God covers Adam and Eve with skin of an innocent animal to cover their nakedness and sin. From the very beginning, we see the concept of covering and substitutionary atonement. This innocent animal presumably killed for their skins, we get a picture of God's creation as a perfect closed system. A sin is introduced that causes a chain reaction. God has to account for it at some point. Sin begat another and another and another. It would eventually, progressively, chronically poison the whole perfect closed system. First Eve, then Adam, then this innocent animal, now death is introduced into what had been eternal perfection. Mankind could no longer be in the physical or spiritual presence of God. They are cast from God's presence in the garden. I mean physically. They would melt like wax before true perfection. Don't believe me? When Moses took the people to the foot of God's mountain, covered in Exodus 19 and 20, they begged Moses to make the sound and presence of God stop because it was killing them. Anyway, God sends his watcher class angels to literally block man out of the presence of God. There would obviously need to be some solution, but meanwhile, this enmity between the seed of the woman and the Nakash we call Satan plays out immediately. Cain and Abel, two sons, the younger one, pleasing, the elder one, not so much. Murder happens. God places a mark of protection, actually, on Cain so that men don't kill him when they come to know what he did. He goes off and becomes a builder of great cities. Let's go see what man can do, right? There are two genealogies presented right away. A distinction. God's way, the fallen way. Then we learn about the interference with the seed of the woman by the seed of Satan by way of the Nephilim, the watcher class of angels charged with guarding the gates of Eden and overseeing man become tempted away and plot together to marry earth women. They came down on Mount Hermon and took themselves wives from all that they chose. Being different kinds of beings than human, they did all manner of hybridizing and muddied the lines of seed. In addition, they taught man all matters of arts and sciences, ones presented as immoral, but outside of the system that God had designed for mankind. God obviously intended for us to be free from the burdens of war, lust, and materialism. God had told mankind to eat only food of the earth, no meat yet. As 
time went on and the generation of those sons of God, the Nehat Elohim, that violated earth women died, their progeny ruled over the earth, over humans, and by hybridizing, lost control and devolved into complete debauchery, evil, and wickedness. Up to this time, we learned it had not rained before, and water uh, was in a canopy over the earth. So God found Noah, one who was righteous. Not that he was good, but the same word used for red heifer, genetically pure, without blemish. God attempts to redeem his creation by starting over. He sends a flood and wipes out the whole world except Noah and his wife, their three sons, and their wives. The canopy overhead busted and the wells of the deep exploded up. This is so crucial to understand. Today, so many think sinful human beings compelled God to simply destroy the whole world. If there were not Nephilim muddying God's genetic creations and bloodlines, why would God destroy the whole world just because man said curse words or had a bad attitude? Don't we sin today more than they did in the antediluvian world? In fact, Jesus in prophecy says, in the last days it will be as it was in the days of Noah. Well, where is our flood? This flood had a designed purpose. The flood waters abate. Time goes on. The Nephilim are reduced in number by the flood, but end up reappearing later. So how did Nephilim end up here after the flood if God destroyed all? There is what theologians call a second incursion on the earth. But no, the Bible clearly says that prior to the flood, all flesh had been corrupted. All means all. That includes the wives of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. But now there are only three muddied, and when they have children with the pure Shem, Ham, and Japheth, their kids will only be a quarter hybrid, then an eighth, and the grandkids gone in a few generations. But the Bible says Ham did or saw something to his father while naked that results on a curse on Ham's grandson, Canaan. And as we know, since Abraham, several generations down the line, would encounter and fight Nephilim, Genesis 14, that Ham's sin involved somehow keeping them around. The passage is confusing, no doubt incomplete. But what is clear? The issue had something to do with nakedness and covering, a theme we see continuing. And did Noah curse Ham? No, he provided Ham a substitute and cursed his grandson Canaan. Then we learn about this Geborim, larger than life, a giant, mighty hunter before God, a celebrity, Nimrod, or as noted in secular history on the Sumerians' kings list for our atheist friends, Enmerkar. The Tower of Babel, all over again, we can be as gods, our eyes will be opened, we are so technologically advanced, let's build. In God's perfect closed system, now infected by sin, people go from living for hundreds of years to under a hundred if they're blessed. Sin has this effect of being chronic, progressive, and fatal. Of Ham's line and a few in Japheth's line, tribes from fallen ones in Nephilim spread around the globe after God confounded their languages. As they spread to the four corners, cultures we would recognize today took root. Noah's other son, Shem's line, remained pure, no Nephilim descent further verifying that God would protect the passing of his line of seed. This is verified by genealogies being compared to the cultures of secular world history. So more generations passed. In Genesis 12, God targets a man named Abraham, a descendant of Shem, for a special task. Interestingly, he and Shem's lives overlapped by at least a century. We do not know whether they met or not, but some believe with scant evidence that Shem became a sort of high priest in the community that formed first in the Turkish mountains where the Ark came to rest, and where its remnants remained for centuries as a sort of shrine. This is pretty commonly known today in Turkey. You can visit the sites that have a visitor center, ship remnants, and ballast stones weighing several tons nestled in the mountains of Ararat. Anyway, God orders Abraham to leave his home and go to a place that he would show him. Why? What did God have up his sleeve? Why did he need a certain line of people? Why did God call out a people in Abraham and what would be Israel? The first reason. In our fallen state, we had become disintegrated from God and began to experience injustice. Over countless generations, man's emptiness and longing replaced the memory of God. They had forgotten him. Satan's most successful deception, even today, is to get man to glorify himself. 
to fill the void of forgotten connection to God with man-made idols and rituals, but the well-intentioned and misguided attempt often focused on the creature instead of the creator. To solve this, God would use a people to reclaim himself to the people and civilizations of the time that Abraham and his descendants would encounter. In man's obstinacy, as is shown in the case of Pharaoh's, man sought for God to prove himself. Note that the ten plagues in Egypt during the Exodus, for example, were targeted to the ten gods in Egypt believed to have primary and secondary supernatural power. I am Yahweh, the Tetragrammaton said, I am, and proved it. The whole of Exodus is essentially God proving his sovereignty, reteaching, reigniting, reconnecting, or at least providing options to reconnect. The second reason God is calling out a people in Abraham that would become Israel is around the time God was making this covenant with Abraham to raise up a multitude in him, he also frequently opened the wombs of select and barren women, clearly pointing to the fact that he had a plan of descent, perhaps related to this enmity between lines of seed, the woman, and Satan's. God would call out a people to pass the line of seed to the Messiah. God makes big promises to Abraham, but Abraham decides not to wait on God, has a son, Ishmael. God comes along and says, nope, not him, but one I will. Call him Isaac. Why? Because Sarah was old and laughed at the power of God to have her be pregnant at her age. So Isaac is born. He is the one. And the firstborn Ishmael is kind of passed aside for a time. Hmm. Younger over the older again. So after a time, God says, prove you're loyal. Kill Isaac as an offering to me. Abe raises the knife. God says, stop, don't kill Isaac. I will provide you a substitute. Ah, hmm. Nakedness, covering, substitute again. The third reason God would call out a people in Abraham who would be Israel is that these special called out people would in time annihilate the remnant of the Nephilim, now present in the tribes of Canaan. The peoples know a curse. In Genesis 14, just such things happen. Abraham fights and destroys the Rephaim, Zamzamim, Emim, some of the Nephilim remnant. It is instructive to look up the names of these tribes in a Bible dictionary. They are revealed to be the giants and genetic hybrids. God gave Abraham victory because God's will is to see his line of seed through time. So we have this thesis statement in Genesis 3, 15 and 16 about enmity between the woman and Satan's seed. And he will uh, bruise the heel and the line seed of woman will crush the head. We have God calling out a people to accomplish his three main goals. As we trace Abraham's descendants, beginning with his children, our understanding will be further proven. Contrary to hearing in our Judeo-Christian society that the honor fell to the firstborn in Bible times, we see the opposite continually play out. Abel over Cain, Isaac over Ishmael. Now Isaac has sons, Esau and Jacob. On Isaac's deathbed, Jacob tricks him at the prodding of his mother, taking advantage of his frailty and obtains what should have been the birthright and blessing for the firstborn Esau. Needless to say, Esau was not happy. Jacob became I, though, and went in search of a wife and was offered a man named Laban's first daughter, Leah. But he didn't want her. He fell in love with a younger sister, Rachel, and wants to marry her. But Laban, Rachel's father, tricks Jacob into marrying Leah, the older sister he didn't want. Jacob did have children with her, but still wanted Rachel and stayed in Laban's service until he had worked long enough to have Rachel too. Jacob's will was to pass his seed into Rachel for descendants. After all, there is a covenant you made with my granddad Abraham, Lord. I need to get busy. But God's will was for the line of seed to pass into Leah, the one Jacob did not even want. To Leah, sons would be born. A certain son would be born with a name we all recognize one named Judah. Jacob, who would become Israel, has 12 sons in total from multiple women, one of whom passed the line of seed. Leah had Judah. With 12 sons, the work of goal one, reminding the world of I am the living God, can happen much more readily than with just a few sons. Israel comes of age, even reconciles with his brother Esau. When he sees him coming from afar, he sends gifts and people ahead of him to gauge his mood. And when they're about to meet, Jacob sends a substitute just to make sure he is forgiven before they embrace. Thanks, substitute. I know I can be in his presence now. They get cool in the short term. 
There's another weird little vignette where Israel wrestles an angel and there's a ladder to heaven and a hand going under a covering to loins. Weird seed stuff. And Jacob's name is changed to Israel. He struggles with God in one translation. So Jacob, now Israel, has his favorite son, the boy named Joseph. In fact, Israel gives Joseph a coat of many colors. Oh, again, a covering. The father covers his son. Joseph's brothers hate him. They are jealous. The brothers plot and fake Joseph's death, Judah among them, and sell Joseph into slavery and then present the coat, Joseph's cover, drenched in blood to Israel, his father. Here again, the cover and blood and the father. The brothers in their jealousy didn't care that Joseph's ability to dream and interpret was their generation's manifestation of the special covenant between God and their family through their great-grandfather Abraham. Joseph is devastated by having to leave the land of his family and go into Egypt. A subtle detail missed because of the way this story is interpreted. Joseph values his family a covenant more than the wealth, power, and prestige he would ultimately rise to in pagan Egypt because he named his younger son Ephraim, which means God has prospered me in the land of my affliction. Wait a second. He is adorned in gold. He stands beside Pharaoh as number two, and the whole society bows to him as he goes by on chariot. But this he calls the land of his affliction. That last little part's not mine. It's Vody Bauckham's. Interesting, though. God uses Joseph to bring the Hebrews into Egypt, setting the stage for his glory as he would lay waste to the pagan gods of Egypt and make himself known to the civilized world of that time. As second in command in Egypt, some believe Pharaoh himself, Joseph remained devoted to God and his great-grandfather's covenant. He takes the name Zaphonath Paneah, which ironically in Egyptian means the beloved of Anu, Interesting when considering the modern emergence of intervention theory with the Anunnaki and the Bible's frequent references to Anu, the sons of Anak, remnants of giants of the Nephilim. Anyway, while all this is happening, Joseph's brother Judah is back in the land of their covenant dealing with some interesting life twists of his own. Judah leaves his brothers and in the course of events meets a Canaanite woman, marries her, and by her has two sons named Ur and Onan. The Bible tells us Ur was wicked in God's eyes and was struck dead, but not before leaving behind a widow. This poses an issue if the transmission of seed is one's life's mission. Judah goes to his other son Onan and says, hey, take your brother's widow to bed. He does that, but Onan relieves himself on the floor, citing the inappropriate nature of his father's request. God did not like that and struck him dead too. The widow, Tamar, now in mourning, again fully covered her features. One day Judah sees her, and not recognizing her, mistakes her for a harlot, propositions her for sex, material wealth in exchange for sex. Luckily, Judah found favor with God. Despite that up to this point in his life he had faked his brother Joseph's death, lied to their father Israel, sold Joseph into slavery, murdered some Shechemite men and more, the line of messianic seed was the will of God. The Bible does not indicate whether as part of the covenant his family had with God he was aware of the unique mandate, but it cannot be overlooked that in an entire book about Joseph, one out of place chapter tells this macabre story full of a depraved man being rewarded and one who did barely anything being struck down. But we must remember that God has a specific will to be accomplished. Judah's actions seem so deliberate, it is as if he is aware of what must be done. So the Bible is loaded with genealogies and these weird stories that our culture has turned into morality lessons. Joseph, for example, hates Egypt, but we say, oh look, he was faithful, so God made him rich. Unfortunately, we missed the point. We clap for old Miss Smith at the Bible study when she pronounces the name Mahulalel. Yay, clap, but wait, think about it. The Bible has genealogies. Why? It's a battle between lines of seed. In his book, The Benedict Option, Rod Dreher defines the tenor of modern Western Christianity as 
morally therapeutic deism. Unfortunately, we read the Bible this way. We have the Ten Commandments and Jesus' golden rule as our standard, and we interpret the behavior of biblical characters as right or wrong based on it. But now we change our view, our thesis statement in reading the Bible, understanding the three reasons for God calling out a line of people. Now we have some context for things we looked at before and said, oh, that was just a different time. Why morally questionable things, murder, lying, went unpunished, and God lifted up and used those people. Yet others were struck down for what seems like nothing. In addition to the actions of men like Judah, Abraham lied to Pharaoh about Sarah, his wife, being sister. And God revealed this to Pharaoh in a dream. Ironically, that act alone could have destroyed Egypt. This was not punished. At one point in a strange few verses, God almost struck Moses dead for some seemingly obscure reason. Now, back to Joseph, who by all appearances had lived a model life, stayed true in his heart to God, but stayed and prospered in Egypt. He married a daughter of one of the priesthood of An, another reference to Anu. The daughter's name was Anyaset, Asenath. The Sumerians referred to these gods as Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared, the sons of God, Genesis 6. As a famine put the family of Israel at risk, Joseph used his power to bring his family into Egypt where there was plenty. Benjamin, the youngest, was taken as ransom to ensure the brothers would return with Jacob, Israel, to Egypt. Although Judah stepped in and offered himself to Joseph saying, no, please let the boy go. I will be his substitute. Ah, Judah was redeemed for his earlier sins. And Joseph would trick his dying father, as his grandfather had done, by switching the hand of blessing from the older onto the younger. So the book of Genesis ends with another example of either covering blood or substitution. Over centuries, God's chosen covenant people became enslaved to the Egyptians in Egypt. All the while, God is still attempting to accomplish his goals, exposing himself as sovereign before the cultures of the world. Moses would end up rising up as a leader, and leaving Egypt in shambles led the Israelites, now a multitude, out of Egypt and back toward the land of promise, the land that had far fewer remnants of the Nephilim because the Israelites' own enemy from time to time would cross into Canaan and destroy the tribes. God used Pharaoh's own defects of character to destroy themselves and some of the enemies of Israel in Canaan. On the eve of Israel's departure, the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed, and the blood of the lamb was used to cover the door of the covenant people so that the destroyer plague might pass them, once again covering blood. And contrary to the narrative always saying firstborn supremacy, we see the firstborn brought down. Abel over Cain, Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, and so on. Moses led the people out to the foot of the mountain of God, yet in their fallen state they could not be in the presence of God. The sound and presence of God was enough to scare them so bad they begged Moses to intercede. In their sin, both physical and spiritual, they had to engage in all number of cleansing rituals for days before being able to even stand at the foot of the mountain. Exodus 19 noted that even touching the mountain of God meant death. As there had been 12 sons, now 12 full tribes would emerge. Now God's mission in having a chosen people is being accomplished. He is preeminent in the world and will now give his law. A priesthood is raised up in the tribe of Levi to administer its rituals. At the center of it is a system of sacrificing an innocent animal whose blood will cover the people for their sins. God reminds them of the garden again. He is still passing a line of seed through the characters and events shared about them in Scripture. The remnants of the Nephilim are still being destroyed as the books of the law, judges, prophets progress. The references to all the various encounters with the remnants of the Nephilim abound. Video description. We then begin to see the relationship of the law to the people, their inability to keep it, their punishment, redemption, punishment, redemption, all the while sacrificing animals, blood covering, and over and again. Finally, Israel, now a nation, reaches its apex under King David from the line of Judah, the man who himself destroyed what may have been the last of the Nephilim, Goliath and his brothers, six fingers, double rows of teeth, 
as king, he himself would sin from time to time. The whole history showed, and the prophets echoed, that man could not keep God's law, God's perfect law. They were trapped in a seemingly endless cycle that went all the way back to the beginning. All the while prophets heralded the coming of the promised Messiah who would come from the line of seed God protected through time. Then, finally, after 400 some years of silence, when the prophets stopped speaking, the angel appeared to Mary and said, You will conceive by the Holy Spirit. The Savior of his people was born. He began his ministry, brought a fitting twelve unto himself and taught. He honed the mark of God in them. The only problem with this seemingly perfect story is that all the while Satan continued to say, Did God say this? And did God say that? Israel, God's chosen people, had been duped into ritual. All those times back in the land of Canaan that God said, destroy them all, leave not one living or their things. Time and again, people like Joshua's Achan had kept Nephilim material and God destroyed all of them. For all the atheists you know that point to God as a butcher for the killing of the Canaanites, this narrative should more than make up for that. Now, having been duped, having had periods where they lost their own scrolls of God's law for hundreds of years at a time, it finally took pagan seers from the East to recognize what was coming in the birth of Christ. Having built so much ritual and orthodoxy around their laws, Herod sought to kill the Messiah before he was even a child. When Jesus entered Jerusalem and ate his last supper with his twelve, he uncovered their feet and washed their naked feet. Soon they would all be clean again. And when they drank wine as the symbol of blood and ate bread as the symbol of body, Jesus was telling them, I, as a holy divine, holy human descendant of the line of seed that God protected for all of time, I, the Lion of Judah from the house of David, I, who have been given power that any can be made sons of God, redefining a term that in the Old Testament meant the fallen ones from Genesis 6 would now mean a restored, forgiven son of God. He was betrayed, turned on, put on trial, bloodied with a whip, crucified, and died. Even his apostles didn't understand. They misinterpreted his series of supernatural events as a way to bring glory to God in popular culture. He had cried in the garden, Do not pour out this cup of wrath, the physical sin and spiritual filth of mankind of all time, but not my will, yours. He was on the cross. He recited psalms, wondering why in this moment God forsook him. In a final attempt, knowing that his time was coming to a close, the Nakash, the deceiver, spoke in the form of a man beside him on another cross. If you're God, save us. Get me down. Get you down. And finally, it is finished. The ground shook. The veil in the temple, the Levite temple, the veil that kept man from God, was torn in two. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is the word, the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. No longer did there need to be a veil. No longer did it matter whether one had pure seed, line, blood, or Nephilim. All could be saved by the blood of the Lamb, a physical and spiritual repair to the greatest dilemma of all time. Back in the garden, after his death, his apostles scattered and believed this to be a failed endeavor. And after a few days, word began to spread about the body missing from the tomb. He was alive. And he appeared to many. The book of Acts says there were hundreds of living witnesses to his resurrected presence. And in case there was any question about who he was, he told the men on the road to Emmaus that Moses wrote about him. So for us... What must we do? Be born again, born of water, physical birth, and born of the Spirit, meaning born into Jesus Christ as sons and daughters of God, Jew or Gentile, Nephilim or Israelite. The forgiveness of God was penal. 
not because we said a bad word, but because we had a very tangible blotch that was destroying the order of the natural world. All of creation cried out for us to be cast into the pit. But God, in his act of sacrificial love, accomplished the greatest act in human history. This is the gospel. God sacrificed his only begotten son to cover us in our nakedness. Now, no matter what, Jesus has conquered death. He repaired the sin in the garden and restored us to God. Now, we must consider if we are willing to humble ourselves, not listen to Satan who says, glorify yourself, we're so smart with our technology and advancement and gender this and that and man is the pinnacle and listen to the still small voice who says, blessed are the meek. The Bible is the story of the redemption of man from the thesis to God's three purposes. Feel free to look for morality stories, but the most real thing in the world is where we stand in the context of this story. Oh yes, in the book, the Bible, 66 books, there are others to be sure, but 66 we know, sufficient books, over 40 authors spanning 1,500 years, for those that doubt, were never originally intended to be put together into one book. Let that sink in.